Hello everyone, welcome to my session 5 presentation on large scale standardized testing and some testing terminology. I have three goals for this session. To review some testing terminology, which a few, a few of those will be on your vocabulary and your own words. To clarify the difference between a norm referenced and a criterion reference test, which some of you know already. And to expose you to the intricacies, cost, and care they go into creating a large-scale test. In this presentation, I do not propose to regurgitate what's written in Pop Popham's chapter or the Toch or Kamara document. What I would like to do is point you in some areas in the session's readings that will help you form a rounded opinion or more rounded opinion of this important topic. One of the big ideas of this course is the difference between a norm referenced and criterion reference test. If you walk away with anything from this course, you better walk away with knowing uh, be, that the difference and being able to distinguish those two. Simply put, a norm reference test compares test results with a sample of students that have already taken the test. Uh, you're familiar with many of these, the SATs, the ACTs, the GREs, and any other tests that compare your scores to a normal curve and other students who have taken the test. On the other hand, a criterion reference test compares test results with a standard or domain like our state assessments. Theoretically, everyone could get a four. However, after the results are in, the, the education department determines the cut points. Uh, in other words, what raw score equals a four, a three, two, etc. So while in theory everyone can get a four, because the state sets these cut points after the test results are in, it can't happen. Uh, I placed an asterisk at the top of this uh, slide to remind you that any test given in the same way to all students is considered standardized, including the test teachers create and administer to their classes. So please speak intelligently when you talk about large-scale standardized tests. Otherwise, you're bashing your own tests. Um, you can see from this slide what a normal distribution looks like, and most of you know that already. Um, but what you probably don't know is that 68% of the scores fall between the minus one and the plus one standard deviation. Uh, so you would not want to use one of these norm reference tests for accountability because it's already programmed where students, 68% of the kids are going to fall in the middle. So no matter how many times those kids take it, they're going to get, you're going to get the same frequency, theoretically. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on measures of central tendencies. Uh, you should have all been exposed to these terms at some point in your educational career. In this slide, I've used a column of numbers to indicate the mean, the mode, the median, and an outlier, a score that falls, falls way outside of the others and can skew the average or the mean, which is why one might want to use the median or the mode uh, to indicate how a group of students did on a test. Um, you will be talking about this when you take and, and give your own test and use your scores uh, to talk about those results. Um, I do want to mention two types of scores that are generated by a norm reference test, age equivalents and percentiles. Percentile indicate, indicated where you stand in relation to others who have taken the test. So if you score on 80%, that means you've done better than 80% of the students that have taken that test and that there's only 20% of students who took it that did better than you. Uh, and an age equivalent is what many of elementary sc school teachers are used to, especially with reading exams, uh, where students receive an age equivalent, the student is reading on a third grade level. Um, but you got to be careful with age level scores. Um, many parents will get their students or their child's scores back and see that, oh, my four-year-old is reading on a 3.5 grade level. I got to get him into the fourth grade. Well, no. It just means it's a four-year-old reading on a equivalent of a third grade level, but not that they should be in there. So it, it really is 
you have to be careful when using those scores. Uh, just it's just giving yourself a benchmark of where those kids uh, fall in relation to their peers. Uh, in our discussion for the next two sessions, we're going to look at test the test creation process. Many of you will be entering this course with preconceived notions about large-scale standardized tests, typically because you did not do well on them. This does not make the test bad. Just like bombing a teacher-made test doesn't necessarily make it bad. In ancillary materials for this session, I've included a flowchart of the New York State 15-step process. Um, and so you can understand why it's, why it's costly. Uh, the last thing I want you to look at is the relative cost of making these tests. In our discussion, many of you will rail about the costs. And uh, there's an art, that's why I want you to read an article by Chin Chingos in our readings. He, d he do did a study uh, of the costs of making large scale standardized tests. And you will find that they take up less than one quarter of 1% of a district school budget. You can't buy much for that. Um, you should also look at the website uh, procon.org where you will find arguments on both sides of the standardized test question. Um, and you can see that, that there's a, a lot of them. And many of them are based on research. Many of them are just based on uh, what uh, commonly happens when students are preparing kids for these tests. So you can see that there are um, 22 different uh, pros and cons that are given in this uh, article. So make sure you check that out. It's in, you'll find the link to it in the transcript for this uh, video and it's also in ancillary materials for this sec session. So I'm looking forward to your comments about this process. I'm not trying to convert anyone. Uh, I'm just trying to make you well informed.